morning. I'm Kimberly McQuarrie, the Director of Community Programming and Co-Director of the Innovation Labs at the DALI. Thank you so much for joining us again for this live streaming for our Coffee with the Curator series. Today, we're joined by Peter Tush, Curator of Education at the DALI, for a special seasonal talk on a little discussed part of DALI's body of work, his holiday cards. But before we get to the talk, please join me in thanking the City of St. Petersburg for their continued sponsorship and offering a special thanks to all of our members who make events like this possible. Please visit our website, thedali.org, for more information about online activities and programming, including these upcoming events in conjunction with our Van Gogh Alive exhibit. A few things you might be interested in, um, the Bishop Starry Night, Star Talk and Gazing. We're gonna be having a couple of special dance exhibitions here in January and February a history of art and tech talk, Sheremy Bundrick doing a virtual um, talk and book signing, and of course, several more coffee talks with our great curators here at the DALI. And remember, you can always follow us on social media for the latest DALI Museum happenings and DALI-inspired conversations. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Peter Tush. Peter is the Curator of Education at the Salvador Dali Museum, where he has worked for several decades. He's the key interpreter of the collection and special exhibitions. He trains our docents, scripts our audio guides, directs our school programming, and works with the curatorial team to develop special exhibits. Over the years, he has presented many coffee talks, ranging from women in surrealism to Dali's interest in ghosts. Today, Peter is presenting Dali for the Holidays, Christmas Cards and Catalan Traditions where we'll explore Dali's fascinating, outrageous, yet little known 1950s Christmas card design projects. Please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, and thank you for joining us and watching and tuning in today for our coffee talk. Um, it occurred to me while getting ready in the summer for some of our fall uh, programming and talks that I don't think these holiday cards have ever been discussed formally at the museum. So I set myself the topic and kind of put it on the back shelf. And then as the date got closer, I started to do some research and realized there's not a lot of research to be done. There's uh, bits and pieces strewn across the internet and in a couple books tucked away in some corners. but. Um, so this is going to be a very general, very uh, interesting talk because it's focusing on something that really has not been put together formally in the way that it should. So this will be a lot of fun. Certainly hope it gets you in the mood for the holiday season. And the first thing I wanted to do was share these two photographs of Dolly. I believe these were taken in 1954. Um, I think this was around the time when Dolly was publishing um, a book for Doubleday. And <laughs> It occurred to me that when I looked at this photo of Dolly as uh, Saint Nick or Santa or Papa Noel, there's something very shabby and a little disconcerting. It's a little bit like, um, uh, you know, seeing the least effective Santa possible uh, dressed here and waiting for you. It's like he can't even have the, the full beard in front of his mustache. It just must have itched too much. And then one more photo of him in color this time, 1954, um, signing one of his books at Doubleday. And you can see there's a huge vat of caviar right next to Dolly, as he, of course, has everything pulled away, allowing him the ease for his signature. But there's something about that seems very disheveled, very last minute, very um, uncommitted. <laughs> And that might be an interesting thought to have as we go through some of these holiday designs that Dolly is responsible for. So the first part of this talk, I'm gonna look at just a couple examples of the holiday designs that Dolly did over the years, most of them from uh, the 40s, late 40s and mid 50s. And we know that uh, at a certain point in his career, by about the mid 1930s till early 1940s, Dolly was very comfortable in the world of commercial uh, production. He was comfortable with doing jewelry, with designing um, fashion, doing magazines and book covers and advertisement, and even doing society portraits. So he had really committed himself to being a public artist. As a matter of fact, he says that um, as a Renaissance man, 
I do not consider myself separate from the masses because I am an artist. I am ready to design whatever people want. And so I guess one of the things people want are holiday designs. Which brings us to this really lovely 1948 design that Dolly did. This was for a cover of Vogue magazine. And it has the fir tree, the traditional Christmas tree, on both sides of this particularly um, broken arch. And you can see the star in there. And there's something kind of interesting in the way the design is, uh, is presented here. It's based on Leonardo da Vinci's adoration of the Magi, or the Epiphany. And you can see right in the very back of this uh, image on the right, there's the two trees standing on the two broken arches from that architectural detail in the background of the da Vinci's uh, drawing. This is how it appeared on Vogue magazine, but of course, in a way very similar to what would become um, a signature piece of Mad Magazine, if you folded the two together, you get the image that's on the right. You get the face of the figure with the fir tree almost as a kind of tiara or some sort of a crown on top of the figure. It's really quite lovely, it's beautiful, and it definitely has a kind of holiday uh, quality to it. So that was 1948. That same year, Dolly also did this uh, very lovely and very typically Dalinian study of an angel holding a fir tree, so holding the Christmas tree. And this was actually turned into an advertisement for Brian's Hosiery. And Dolly did a lot of Brian's Hosiery ads. This is the only holiday ad that I could find, but again, 1948. And this very much sets the tone for almost all of Dolly's cards that he'll develop over the years. Go forward about 15 more years, and in 1964, Dolly does this design of an angel holding, I guess, the Christ child for a UNICEF uh, card to benefit children. And that same year, he also uh, does an adaptation of a particular print he had done. This print was done, I believe, 1963 to 64 of um, the Washington Gate in New York City. And he added for a particular small run, the fir tree right in the center. So many of these that you'll find, if you ever do find this, are just the archway itself. But this particular year, for whatever reason, I don't know if these were a series of gifts that Dolly gave around the holidays, but he added the fir tree to it. And in 1967, he does a card for um, one of his publishers, one of his printmakers, uh, Phyllis Lucas and her family. So Dolly does an angel print and has the Xmas, Merry Xmas to the family. And one year later, he does a print that's a greeting card print of uh, Père Noel or Santa Claus um, on top of this extraordinary uh, and very scary looking uh, reindeer that seems to have sprouted a whole series of antlers coming out of it. But it's all very fantastic, it's all very fun, it's loose, and Dolly is being very comfortable with kind of a, almost, I guess, what you would describe as an American view of, um, of the holidays and Christmas. And then jump forward to 1971, and we have this second card for UNICEF, this time a very uh, simple tree with just a few decorations and the star on top, and then probably the father and son down on the bottom right, uh, looking up upon it. So there's a tradition here that runs all the way from 1948 all the way through the 70s where Dolly keeps returning to the fir tree, primarily as a symbol of Christmas or the angel. And there's two more cards I'm gonna show you that as far as I can tell, I can't figure out if these were ever done particularly for uh, holiday cards or if they were turned into holiday cards, but they're two watercolors that Dolly did. I could find no information about the image or the date, so it uh, remained a mystery, at least for this talk, but here we have two angels on a card that became a Christmas card, and then uh, accompanying that is another one of the three kings at the Adoration with the manger scene at the very base of it, and then the building itself is structured as the body of an angel. So very consistently going back to the angel over and over again as a way to depict uh, and celebrate the holidays. So the first group of, uh, of true holiday cards that we're talking about were done for Hallmark. And there's a series of cards that were done in 1948 and then another series of cards that were done in 1959. So the first ones, there's just a few examples of them, but um, I think they were published in 48, but there's a couple places where they're dated at 1952. But this was part of a, a new adventure for, uh, for Hallmark. Hallmark uh, planned to do a run of over 50 artists in 1948 to capture the sheer variety of visual arts in relation to the holidays. And it uh, contained cards by Courier and Ives and Norman Rockwell, but it also contained Pablo Picasso, um, El Greco, um, artists from the past, artists from the present. 
And the idea was simply to use greeting cards as a way to share the great art masterpieces with millions who might never encounter them. So it was very ambitious, and Dolly certainly fit into that program. Um, some of the cards that were done at that time and later by, for example, uh, Norman Rockwell, have become so, so well loved and so um, cherished that they're still reprinted over and over again, years uh, and decades later. Um, that's, that's not the case for Dali, uh, and maybe that, that's very telling. But uh, here's the designs that Dali came up with in 1947 for this initial run. He, I believe, came up with four designs. So we have a Madonna and child here. Seems very lovely, very much a typical Dolly illustration, like the kind that he contributed to a number of book illustrations, like Shakespeare and some of the other works in the Bible from this period. Um, here's a curious one. It's the three wise men, so the adoration. And the wise men themselves look rather typical, if, uh, if unpleasant or unapproachable. But the, <laughs> the, the camels have become quite monstrous and bizarrely strange. And so it is not surprising that this didn't really catch on for the holidays around the world. But um, the next one is the one that I think is probably the most lovely of the three. It's also in a way the most kind of cosmically strange. It's very Dalinian, but it, it might also tell you why these didn't catch on. It's the one called the angel and I have a closer detail of it. And you can see that there's the figure on the, the left-hand side, which I assume is, um, is um, you know, part of the, the manger scene, his face is undefined by just the emptiness inside the architectural detail. So the face is defined by its emptiness. Uh, the Madonna is on the right-hand side. So and between Joseph and the Madonna, you can see that the guitar that's on his lap has also become part of the bridge in the background. And then the angel itself with the wings extended, those wings are actually the mountains in the background, and the angel's face are actually made up of the details of the birds flying together to form the eyes, lips, and nose, and chin. So it's, it's a perfect Dalinian kind of double image. It's somewhat playful. It's still, at the same time, somewhat reverential in beauty, but I'm sure it did not leave a very warm feeling in a lot of people when they were looking for their holiday card to share with their family especially in 1947. So needless to say, these cards, even though they were printed, did not catch on. The one that I think has captivated the imagination of everybody now, but as far as I can tell, was never printed as a card, is this one. And this is Santa with drawers from 1948. As far as I can tell, it's unissued. Um, we certainly have no record of it here at the museum that shows that it was issued. Maybe it was, but... Um, as far as I could tell, it's a bit of a mystery, but it is a wonderfully perverse design, very much like Dolly dressing as Santa, where Santa now has all these drawers opened up and emptying out melting watches, which he seems to be presenting to the young Dolly in the foreground. You can see the holly and the berry right next to him. And it's, it's a little bit like a Santa transforming into a kind of Krampus type of figure. There's something... Um, very disturbing about him. And there's actually, this is curious, there's a little white rabbit in the middle of, uh, of the drawer. So maybe it's also an Alice in Wonderland reference. But uh, he seems to have been buried in the snow as if he's become part of the ice underneath or he's emerging from it. Needless to say, this, as far as I can tell, was not uh, turned into a card. If it had been a card, it probably was the one that was completely responsible for this, the failure of Dolly's uh, holiday cards in this period of time. But later in 2017, it was actually used to illustrate the Times Literary Supplements cover about who created Christmas. And maybe it did find its, uh, its home in a more uh, uh, contemporary environment, which seems to be where it was uh, intended. So now we move into 1959, so 10 years later, Dolly is once again approached by Hallmark. I guess a new venture, probably new leaders there. And what's interesting is they basically um, gave him a really interesting um, criteria. They, they said, we would like you to do some holiday cards, but it doesn't need to be just Christmas. It can be a variety of things. And Dolly basically said, I will do it for 15,000 in cash, which was actually quite an enormous amount of money at that time. He would do 10 greeting cards and he wanted no suggestion from Hallmark for the medium or the deadline. And he said that uh, he would receive no royalties. So it's really a work for hire kind of project. And apparently right after he signed the contract, he did five of them that morning at the St. Regis Hotel. So he loved the idea of the project, he committed to it, and then he did the second half over uh, 
the period of time when he went back to Port Legat that year. But he did them quickly, and some of them are very Dalinian, and some are a little more fantastic and unusual. Um, this is the first one. We have a nativity where it's a little bit anonymous, but it really captures kind of the energy that Dali brought to his compositions. It's very uh, much an open kind of watercolor sketch, but you see the the couple, Joseph and Mary, forming this beautiful sort of triangular uh, composition with the angel off to the side. And then Dolly's signature, as you'll see over and over again, prominently at the base. The next card is the butterfly Madonna, where you have the Madonna and child and this beautiful butterfly. And I've got to say that from 1959 through the 60s, the butterfly becomes a very important component in Dolly's sense of beauty and metamorphosis related to the, uh, the holiday tradition. So this is a, a new detail that we see in 1959. Here's a, a second nativity done for the same uh, um, project. And this one sort of opens up what will become the 1960s project for Dolly with a different company. But this is the Christmas tree of butterflies. So another one of the designs, it's really quite beautiful and elegant. And back in the old Dolly Museum um, here in St. Pete, we had one time actually had created a butterfly tree for uh, the holidays that we had out in our uh, lobby. And it was based on this particular design. There's a, a great quote that was accompanied this particular piece that Dolly has. He said, the tree stands on the great bare Spanish plain, which represents, as it does in other paintings, timelessness and eternity. Surely Christmas is the essence of the timeless and the eternal. The two little figures below are my mother, indicating the tree with her butterfly scepter and spiritual beauty and love, and myself as a boy delighting in having her show it to me. So there's a sense of almost a biography that becomes a part of this and Dolly recalling the times of his youth, which seems to be what Christmas is for him. It seems like Christmas is combined with nostalgia. That seems to come through over and over again with these particular images. Uh, just kind of to wrap up this 1959 group of Hallmark images, here are three of the designs that were not Christmassy, but are very much related to this project. So we have the Easter angel holding the butterfly instead of a fir tree. The one in the middle is called Extravaganza, which I believe was done for Valentine's Day, also with the butterfly motif becoming also part of the body. And then the third one is the mystic rose, which uh, it's the rose blossoming in the middle of a, a kind of Catalan landscape with the water and a, a boat that has become ruined on the shore. And then it seems to be having this kind of glowing quality of it, which I would say is um, an Easter card. And it's curious that it's a different uh, dimension, but it was definitely the way that Dolly designed it originally. And then uh, three more cards. The one on the left-hand side, the crucifixion was done for uh, Easter. The woman in the middle was actually done for, butter, for um, Mother's Day. So she has the butterfly. She looks very much like the Madonna, like the Mary image that we've seen in the Adoration. But here Dolly has transformed her into an image from Mother's Day. And then the final one on the right, the butterfly has a, a quality to it that then matches with the um, the rose right below, below it, and that's the Butterfly Valentine from 1959. The only two that ever were printed by Hallmark are the original two I showed you, and they produced them. It was the Madonna and Child and the Adoration, and even these relatively tame images did not go over well. Um, they didn't sell. They caused a public outcry, which I find really remarkable. A number of people wrote complaining about these cards to the Hallmark Company, and they were pulled from the racks around the country. So several hundred were unaccounted for, and those have become quite collectible over time. There's a, a wonderful book that talks about these, uh, this history of the Hallmark uh, Project and has some references to the Dolly Project. Uh, according to the author, uh, Patrick Reagan, he says that uh, Dolly's take on Christmas was a bit too avant-garde for the average card buyer uh, at that time. The negative publicity response actually led them to pull the cards, and that's why they have become collectible over the years. And as far as I know, these have not been reissued by Hallmark, so I don't know that th if they're out there. If they have, I'm not sure that they've been authorized. But this leads us to the second group of uh, holiday cards, which is a really much more curious and sort of fascinating history. Uh, it's with this German company called Hoxt, and Hoxt has a subsidiary in Spain called Hoxt Iberica. And Hoxt is a company that's um, it's a pharmaceutical company in Germany, uh, opened in the 1800s. 
And they approached Dolly in the mid-1950s to do a holiday card that they could share with their clients, with their pharmacists and customers, and it became a tradition. And what's really remarkable about this, it wasn't a tradition for a year or two. It was a tradition for almost 19 years. And it's just hard to imagine not just Dolly, but almost any artist committing themselves to a project that would be that long running. Uh, there's a book available about this. The first card was produced in 1953, and then 19 more cards were produced between 1958 and 1976. And as I said, they'd send them to their doctors, their pharmacists, and their customers throughout Spain. And so it became a, a really wonderful tradition that Dolly was front and center uh, embodying. This is the uh, logo for the company, for Hoax. Uh, it is now known as a Son Sonofi uh, Aventus, or Avantis, uh, but they were formed in 1863 in Germany, and it's the Spanish subsidiary that uh, was responsible for approaching Dolly. They all have um, Christmas themes, but there's also some references to pharmacy and medical plants and also inventions. So over the years, they're not just holiday cars with fir trees, but they become a little more diversified. And again, the chrysalis and the butterfly are an important component almost throughout the entire run of these cards. The other thing that's really lovely, and I just have one example here, Dolly would add a, um, a statement about what his image was intended to uh, represent on each and every one of the cards. And so I'm going to read those as we go through them because they really do capture sort of the flavor of Dolly's imagination and also the kind of strangeness. I mean, I'm just trying to think of these pharmacists receiving these cards each year and what they must have made of them. But they are very special, they are very Spanish, and they are very modern. So the first one that was in 1953, which was probably a one-off, is this really lovely card, just uh, um, the Papillon Noel, the Christmas uh, tree, once again made with this kind of extraordinary arrangement of butterfly uh, wings and these, uh, you know, the candles cascading down. And the statement that Dolly had is that, uh, well, actually, I don't have that. The next ones, after 1953, they seem to have messages. This one was simply a card. But what is interesting is that recently the original artwork was sold this year for 150,000 euros. So I'm sure the contract was nowhere near that at the time. But then in 1958 to 59, Dolly hits a stride. And as I said, every year he creates one of these cards. So from 1953 to 58, he doesn't vary it radically. But now instead of butterfly wings, it's angel's wings. So in 1958, it's an angel card. And he says that the wings of Nordic mythology settle on the Mediterranean Christmas tree erected in Spanish genealogy. And they all sort of have that kind of ominous uh, uh, tone to them that uh, is very, uh, a lot of words associated with ideas without much explanation of how, how they all connect. But these are really beautiful, quite lovely, and quite strange. You know, so for example, this one is called The Sea from 1959, the following year. And the Christmas tree this time is made of the fins, the tails of codfish. So these are codfish tails that are coming out of the, the seed shell, which is opened up to blossom. And Dolly's statement is that the sea, source of life and continuous creationism, offers now the unexpected microcosm of a Christmas greeting. And that's totally like a perfect Dalinian moment. It's so unexpected that it's very much coming out of his imagination. And the comment is also this strange leap of faith between the sea and the Christmas holiday. And of course, Dolly, living on the Mediterranean, a lot of these are going to have uh, seafaring uh, themes as well. The next year, 1960, Dolly chose Don Quixote, uh, a story which he had uh, illustrated many times, and he's turned Don Quixote himself into the Christmas tree, the Christmas fir, and he says that faced with the offensive disintegration of materialism, Don Quixote rises in trunk and armor out of the Christmas tree. <laughs> so very much keeping in uh, the tradition of his uh, illustrations, and you can see it's also like a stage where the curtain has been pulled aside and we're about to witness the story of Don Quixote as a theatrical experience. The next year, he followed this theme by turning to Velazquez and the Infanta. And here, the Infanta, instead of holding the rose, she's actually holding another fir tree with the bluebird coming out of it at the very top. And he says, the sumptuous Velazquian Infanta offers us his Christmas, this Christmas, 
a unique tree, the bluebird of Christmas trees. And the rose is right at the very peak of that tree. The next year, we go off into crazy land, into scientific uh, ideas. And this is astronautic Christmas for 1962. Dolly says that the flames of alchemy melt the lead of this painting, out of which the first astronautic Christmas arises, whose Christmas tree rises over the summits of the ideal towers. So Dolly's enthusiasm for scientific discovery becomes also a part of his approach to this project. Uh, the next year is one of my favorites. This is an uh, octopus from 1963, and it's an octopus print. You can see that the octopus was pressed into the image to create the uh, design. And then you have all these uh, candles lit on each of the tentacles of the octopus, mimicking the idea of the Christmas tree. And Dolly says that the atlas of the new subaquatic world raises the tentacles of the possible Christmas fortunes. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Um, the next year, very strange. This one's just called Grid. And if you look at it, you start to realize that within that grid, there's another one of these um, uh, fir trees another evergreen, but it's right upon the stage where both sides have been pulled, uh, pulled open, and you can start to notice that in the blue details, there's two eyes peering out at us. And Dolly says that Christmas of 1964 is characterized by maximum visual illusions with optical hallucinatory effects that remind one of the moire before the eyes of our ancestors, and that in Dalinian style, peer out with amazement under the raised curtains of pop art. <laughs> so very ambitious explanation for a very strange card. But um, again, what do pharmaceutical uh, dealers make of this? Um, it's, it's hard to know, but these are very collectible. Uh, the next year, a rather different kind of approach to the design. This is a woman of the drawers. Also, I've seen references to it as Daphne. So Daphne, the mythological figure who turned into a tree. And you can see that Dolly's quote is that over the world opens the hope of hibernation and the anti-gravitational and the anti-gravitation of imminent future. <laughs> Perhaps one of the most ponderous of explanations, but um, certainly captures a certain flavor, Dalinian flavor. The next one is also really fun. This one is 1966. This is coral. So we've seen the octopus that becomes the Christmas uh, tree. Here we have a piece of coral becoming the Christmas tree. And uh, the theme of vital uh, organ regeneration is part of the idea behind this. Uh, Dolly says, life blossoms splendidly from the sea as a coral-like tree, on the branches of which stars, all, uh, which stars all men of goodwill make their nests with the blue background of refulgent uh, stars. So there's a, a sense of just kind of capturing all these different people on different levels. There's two fish down at the bottom that seem to be greeting them with hails. And then there's stars in the sky, which become the lights upon the tree. It's lovely. It's strange. It's very Dalinian. This one, very, very beautiful. Very, very simple and subtle. It's the rose and butterflies in the snow from 1967. Dolly says, in the presence of the melancholic winter angel, the rose of passion blossoms and leaves metamorphosis to protect the butterfly of the Christmas psyche. So you can see a curiously seemingly dejected angel at the bottom right, and then almost kind of religious figure walking over from the left-hand side in this wonderful red, uh, red cloak. 1968 was the first successful heart transplant, and so Dolly does one that's really about that. This one's called Heart. You can see the heart at the bottom, which becomes the base of the tree in the way that the shell was earlier. And then you have this um, red and blue, almost barbell, out of which all the, the leaves are blossoming, the blue leaves. Uh, here you can see the detail, and you can see here the, the angel off to the right-hand side, dressed with a red berrettina, the Catalan berrettina, is holding the, um, the caduceus, or the, phar uh, the pharmacist symbol. And Dolly says, for this one, the roots of Christmas uh, the roots of the Christmas tree rise from the stars whilst its pointed end is transplanted into the earth, into the heart of the earth itself. So very much thinking about science, thinking about um, invention, and thinking about the holiday. 
This one is a little, uh, a little hard to grasp initially, but the figure in the very center, there's a blue figure there with wings. That's Selene, which is the mythological representation of the moon. And in 1969, there was the moon landing. So this one is called Moon Embryo. You can see the tree blossoming at the top. Dolly says, the human footprint fertilizing the entrails of Selene give rise to her vivid stone lap to the roots of a Christmas tree. So Christmas and the discovery of a new world in outer space. The following year, again, a really beautiful one in 1970 called Sugar Bells. And I'm sure you're familiar with the image of the girl skipping rope, which rhymes with the bell tower, and then the girl as part of the bell tower. Here we have six young girls who are bluebells. So they themselves have become the bells. And you can see the uh, butterfly at the very top of this. Dolly says, the sugar bells, faced with the forces of evil, peel out the litany of flower power of the Christmas camp, uh, Campanulus. So there's a sense of also the time, time period, that this has something to do with flower power uh, and the fact that it's a floral Christmas tree. 1971, we have a mermaid, mermaid on the beach, a sugar uh, cherry savored under the evergreen Christmas tree gives rise to June, the paranoid plentitude of the joyful beaches of memory. So I guess it's too cold in December. So looking forward to a change. The next year, 72, is printed circuits. So very, very different than some of the others. And Dolly has taken a detail from another artist's work and uh, woven it into here. The flame of ideals that shines from the printed circuits will soon transform the chaotic tree of original sin into an upright tree of Christmas putrefactions. <laughs> I don't think that was probably the most popular card that people received that year. Um, 1973, the golden angel. The golden Raphaelesque angel is the bearer of the Christmas tree, illustrious symbol of Gloria in Excelsis Deo. 1974, this rather beautiful star butterfly the un unanimity between angelic and earthly beings intercrosses and gestates in the branches of the Christmas trees under the aegis of the star butterfly. 1975, we have this kind of peekaboo sort of experience with the, the visage of the tree petals. And Dolly says, the angel of men's goodwill on earth. So it's a very, very different approach that year. And then I believe this is the last one in the series, the conch of 1976. And Dolly says, from the snail, magical toy rises the angel that caresses the Christmas tree of all, all childhood dreams. And that brings to a close the cards that Dolly designed. Um, over the years, uh, the Hoxta Iberica also developed these into calendars. And that tradition was continued by the new owners, uh, Sonofi Avantis. And in 2004, they... Um, also came out with a series of uh, calendars using all of the Dolly images. And then they wound up working with the foundation, the Dolly Foundation, and they actually put this uh, collection of watercolors on the road. It was on loan to the foundation for a number of years. And then in 2006, it went on, uh, um, went to Barcelona and Madrid, a few other places. You can see the lovely upside down Christmas tree that they have outside of the exhibition hall. And more recently, the city of Figueres, where Dolly was born, has taken those card designs by Dolly and turned them into holiday decorations for the entire city. So as you would travel around Figueres, you would see these beautiful light displays referencing the Dolly designs that we've uh, just looked at. So now I'm going to conclude the talk very quickly with just a couple holiday traditions in the Catalan region you may or may not be familiar with. The first one is the Cagatillo. And in a way, these traditions sort of capture the flavor that comes through with some of Dolly's very unusual uh, Christmas uh, designs. The Cagatillo is known as the Catalan Christmas log. It seems to be unique to the Catalan region of Spain. It is also known as the Tio de Nadal, but the Christmas log is the big idea. It is a very friendly looking log. Uh, it's also known as the poop log. It's a small log, very friendly face, always has the red uh, Catalan Berrettina cap. Um, and it's always has a red blanket covering up its backside. And he can be made at home by people, or you can go shopping for it. And you see there's a little cork on the nose. You can open that up. Um, he makes the appearance on December 8th and stays until Christmas Eve. Here's a group of them that you can see at market. Very friendly, very beautiful, definitely a lot of fun. You definitely want to have those under your Christmas tree. 
And what they do is the children leave food for, uh, for the cagatillo over the series of days that pass until Christmas Eve. And sometimes you actually put the candies into the, the log itself. So Christmas Eve arrives and children take a big stick and they gather together and they start to sing as they whack the heck out of this poor log. And the idea is that this is the poop log. They are whacking the poop out of the log. And on Christmas Eve, they sing this song, enticing him to poop the presents that they've been looking forward to. Um, here's the song. Uh, this, I've seen several different variations of it, but this certainly captures the flavor of the song that young little uh, impressionable minds would be uh, sharing and singing along with. Uh, poop log, poop nougat, hazelnuts, and motto cheese. Do not poop out salted herring, for they are too salty. If you don't poop right, I'll hit you with a stick, poop log. And they sing this, and they sing this, and they keep whacking it. And afterwards, they have a tasty treat with all kinds of candies that they find underneath the, uh, the blanket. So this is the, uh, the time when, I guess, the, you know, everybody comes together, and it's an unexpected tradition but it certainly makes some sense. And the final thing I'm gonna share is something that I think many of you are very familiar with, which is the other uh, pooping tradition of the holidays in Catalonia, which is the cagane. And the cagane is a figure that goes back probably to the medieval ages. He's called the holy pooper. And this is a particularly, um, you know, almost uh, iconic version of him. And essentially, they're traditional figures from Catalonia and they wear the traditional berrettina, and they're always uh, bare bottom squatting over a pile of poop, and they are called the Christmas crappers. Uh, one of the cognates is hidden behind the nativity scene in every Catalan home. And as we go to a nativity scene, here you can see the cognate is placed above looking down. The idea and the interpretation has become that this is the Catalan peasant giving back to the earth and fertilizing it, which will bring about growth and a new year. It's a very medieval notion, but it has been embraced and you can go around the Catalan region and you will find a number of these figures everywhere. They have become quite popular. Here you see them, uh, you know, a whole slew of them getting ready. They've also been turned into very famous characters, everyone from the Pope to uh, Margaret Thatcher to the president to soccer figures. Anyone who's a popular will become a figure for one of these uh, these traditional cognates. But my favorite one, which I'm going to show you next, and that will pretty much bring us to a close, the largest cognate in the world was for the Merimagnum uh, number one mall, which is located in Barcelona. And it is such a popular and recognized tradition of the Catalan people that this was paid for and placed very prominently in the central arcade of a very major uh, shopping mall in Barcelona. And here's another angle so that you can see them at the Merimagnum number one. I'm sure it put them on the map. A lot of people do not have a cagane to celebrate the holidays with. So uh, it seems like a nice way to also bring to a close this talk about Dolly and the holidays. Hopefully you, uh, you know, got to learn a few new things about uh, Dolly and his approach to the holidays and the tradition. Um, and again, Christmas is not really celebrating the way it is here. It's more the epiphany that's the big holiday in the, um, the Catalan region. But Dolly has really embraced this idea of the tree. And with that, I will conclude with this wonderful photograph of Dolly dining with what appears to be almost a fir tree made out of, um, out of um, um, not shrimp, but um, not lobster either in between, which has escaped my mind completely. But with that idea, uh, happy holiday, Feliz Navidad. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.